words of my mouth, the meditation of each of our hearts, be found acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Seeing God according to his terms. Hearing God according to his terms. It seems almost everywhere we look around us these days, people are battling, almost at war with each other on, in terms of seeing the world their way over against seeing the world another way. I'm not sure if the occupation of downtown Toronto is still going on this morning, but hundreds of people, maybe perhaps even thousands according to the news, gathered yesterday in downtown Toronto in the banking district because they wanted to ex explain the way they see the world how the world is in, in these days by their terms. And obviously, other people would have different points of view, and hopefully it does not come to any kind of violence. But we've seen the same thing on a much larger scale in New York City and other parts of the United States. A struggle between how we see the world. Is it in terms of my point of view, or is it in terms of how that other person sees things? And so often, it leads to conflict if not violent conflict, verbal or conflict between groups. Air Canada just went through that this week as some of their employees were trying to struggle with would they go out on strike and whether they would or would not be allowed to. Seeing things from different points of view. This is exactly where Moses finds himself at a critical, crucial part of his leadership of the people of Israel. He's brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of slavery, He's brought them into this, uh, at least into the wilderness, leading to the promised land. But he comes to a point where he is perhaps getting, we might say in modern terms, a little bit burnt out, a little bit uncertain about where his life and his leadership is going. And so he cries out to God. He says, God, show me your presence, because I cannot lead your people any further than right here if you do not show your presence to me. I want to see you on my terms, is basically what Moses was saying to God in this deliberate confrontation, this deliberate challenge to God himself. I want to see your presence or I'm not going any further. He lays it all on the line before God and God picks up the challenge. Standing on the top of a mountain, meeting with Moses, God says to him, you cannot see me face to face. You're only human. If you were to see me face to face, you would surely die. But, God says, speaking back to Moses on his terms, he says, I will place you in the cleft of a rock. Who identifies that in terms of a well-known hymn? Rock of ages, cleft for me, lest I hide myself in thee. God says, it's all right, Moses, for you to see me, but you cannot see me face to face. You cannot see me completely and fully, or you would die. But I will respond to your cry. I will respond to your challenge and show you my back. I will pass in front of that cleft in the rock where I hide you, where I put you for protection, and you will see my back. I mean, you might say, what is this all about? Why is God playing games with Moses? You can't see my face, but you can see my back. I don't think it's in those terms at all. It's a bit more of a, a, an image matter, a metaphor. God says to Moses, I won't show you everything about me, but I will show you my back. And how do you see the back of someone? By following them. If you're following a leader in a game as a child, or if you're following someone, maybe a guide on a hike, you see their back. You trust them with faith to follow where they lead. Just on the, the local news, someone survived a fall off the escarpment just in the last couple days. Uh, apparently they weren't roped in. Perhaps they weren't following a guide. And that led to their taking the wrong step over the edge of the escarpment. But what God is saying to Moses here in this metaphor of his back is, I'm not giving you perfect sight. I'm not going to give you what I alone have, and that's a perfect understanding. I'm not going to give you a perfect GPS-guided roadmap so you can go off on your own and do your own thing and complete your life all on your own. But what I am giving you is an invitation to follow, 
to see my back and to follow where I lead you. And in fact, that is what Israel and Moses, their leader, most needed to hear at this critical juncture. That God was not going to leave them alone, put them out into the wilderness, seeing everything clearly, or at least so they might have thought, and allowing them to do it themselves. But what God is saying to Moses and to Israel at this juncture of their history is, I'll lead you. I'll be with you always. I won't abandon you in the wilderness, and I will guide you into that promised land if you follow in faith, if you follow where I lead in trust. Perhaps not knowing the full road map, perhaps not knowing where the next step is going to be, but being secure in the knowledge that I am leading you and guiding you in perfect love and according to a perfect plan that will unfold as you follow my back and as you take step by step by step. This is exactly what the writer of the book of Hebrews is saying if you were to have a look at chapter 11 of Hebrews. It's all about faith. It's all about following God's back, following his lead where he goes. In fact, the first verse of that chapter defines faith in wonderful terms. It says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the assurance of things not yet seen. Faith isn't knowing everything perfectly, having a perfect GPS roadmap so that, which we can follow on our own. Faith is about putting our trust in God to go before us, to follow his back, to go where he leads us. The whole book of Hebrews chapter 11 is a wonderful statement of that truth again and again and again. By faith, Abel offered to God a sacrifice. By faith, Abraham obeyed God. By faith, Moses. By faith, Moses. By faith, Moses. God was laying out for Moses his terms, and they're not our terms. The very same thing, the very same thing happened with Jesus one day in an encounter with those who were also struggling with their way over against God's way. We read between the lines this encounter between some Jewish religious leaders and Jesus one day when they brought out a coin. I think I have a coin here. I did. My wife gave it back to me, I think. That's what we do with it, Jane. Yes, a coin. In this case, a Canadian toonie. But in the story that Jesus was involved with, the, Roman, the Jewish religious leaders pulled out a Roman coin. And it had the face of Caesar on that coin. And they wanted to challenge Jesus. And they said to him, here's a Roman coin, Jesus. Should we, Jewish people, is it right for us Jewish people to pay taxes to Caesar? Or should we just stand up and say, no, that Caesar is claiming to be the god of this world, the one that everyone should bow down before, and should we stand up and say, no, we're not paying taxes to Caesar? What they were trying to do was draw Jesus into a political debate. Perhaps some of them thought that what Jesus as the Messiah should be about is leading a revolution against Caesar, whose picture was on that coin. Perhaps some of them just thought that they would put Jesus on the hot seat. And if he said, no, don't pay taxes to Caesar, well, then they could pass the word over to the Roman officials. Jesus would be arrested in no time, thrown in a cell, and he'd be done with. No more headache from this man, Jesus of Nazareth. Either way, they'd have their way, or at least so they thought. But what they were doing was laying out their terms, not God's terms. And Jesus' response to them, he kind of almost avoids the issue of the coin altogether. He says, give the coins that have Caesar's name on them to Caesar, but focus on the things of God and give to God the things that are of God. Jesus' terms are God's terms turned their question totally on its ear. We're not to be caught up in things of this world and things of coins and taxes to Caesar. Yes, we have to deal with that. That's part of life. But that is not where our primary focus and our energy should be put. And Jesus was saying, instead, your energy should be put into the things of God. And in another place, he said a very well-known verse that's been put to music. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, 
and then I will look after all those other little details, the toonies and loonies, and the taxes and the realities in your life. Give to God the things that are of God. Give to, ta give to Caesar the things of his, but focus on seeking first the kingdom of God. They thought they were going to force Jesus' hand, but Jesus reversed it and turned it back on them. We in the 21st century face, we in the church in the 21st century face the same kind of temptations, the same kind of challenges again and again. We say to God, we want to have it all clear. We want to know exactly where we're going and we want to have you respond to us on our terms. But God says to us, as he did to Moses, as he did to the religious leaders through Jesus, I want you to understand things on my terms. I want you to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then trust me to guide you, to go before you so that you can see my back and know that I am caring for you. Some of you perhaps have been to an educational uh, workshop with some of the elders and uh, Reverend J.P. Smith is our Synod educational consultant. Gives workshops all across our area of Synod and uh, he was talking recently in a very warning tone in one of his workshops that I sat in on, where he said there's such an important, we are at such an important time in the life of the church where we need to be sure that our focus is on the things of God and not simply on the material things that allow us to survive. To focus on the spiritual matters that allow us to thrive was his point rather than just on the matters of getting by day by day, the things of Caesar. The moderator, our current moderator, Rick Horst, who's coming here as part of our 175th anniversary, says the very same thing. Maybe you read it in the Presbyterian Record this month. He says, when we grasp afresh that our priority mission in Christ is to address human hurts and human hopes, and not matters of institutional maintenance, then we begin to discover God's true call to us. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will fall into place. I was very encouraged when I, we heard our treasurer write in his recent financial statement a comment where he said in calculating where we're at financially that we have almost reached 100% of the budgeted givings for missions, for others in words, in other words, outside ourselves, around the world and close to home. We're only about three quarters of the way through the year, but George made the point, he said, this is truly a church that cares about mission. And I applaud you on George's behalf for that very thing. That is an expression of doing the things unto God that are God's and leaving to Caesar the things that are of Caesar. We need to focus in all of our life on the things of our God, trusting in him to lead us and to guide us and to provide for us as we seek the things that allow us to not just survive, but to be about the things that allow us to thrive. We've heard about some of those this morning already. And I applaud those who are engaged in activities like our pneumonia prevention vests with our WMS and other things that I won't mention. You've heard them mentioned today already. Expressions of a desire by this congregation not just to survive, but to thrive. In all of our life, to keep our hearts and minds focused on God's kingdom is critical, is crucial in these days perhaps more than ever, for the life and the future of the church hang in the balance. Here, everywhere, today and yes, unto all eternity. Let us bow together in prayer.